Welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path, and I'm your host, Mike Allen. He may be the most underappreciated and under-acknowledged figure from United States colonial times. Now, Noel Webster, of course, gets all the credit for starting the American Dictionary, but the West Hartford native really does not get his just due for most of the other truly remarkable contributions that he made. We're going to try and fix some of that today by speaking with John Mainville. He's the executive director of the Noah Webster House, the building where young Noah grew up. John's going to be along in just a minute, and he's going to amaze you when you learn of all the things that Noah Webster did that you had no idea about. This week's trivia question. The oldest chapter of this organization in Connecticut is turning 100 years old this year. And although they're not in the medical field, they have been shown to help our mental health. What is this group? We'll stick around after the main program for the answer because then you'll know the topic for next week's show. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is brought to you by our sponsor, Yale New Haven Health. When people need the best quality health care, there's a reason they turn to Yale New Haven Health. In 1826, Yale New Haven Hospital became Connecticut's very first hospital. They were the first hospital in the U.S. to use chemotherapy. Yale New Haven was the first to introduce insulin pumps for diabetic patients. And they introduced the world's first intensive care unit for newborns. For more information about Yale New Haven Health, visit YNHHS.org. That's YNHHS.org. Well, he's sometimes called the man who should be mentioned more frequently when we talk about the so-called founding fathers of our country. But he's not, really. Now, those who really know all the contributions made by Connecticut's Noah Webster feel he gets a little bit shortchanged by not being mentioned more frequently with the likes of Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, John Adams, Samuel Adams, Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, and so on and so forth. You see, Noah Webster did so much more than create the first American dictionary. In fact, he had a wide range of impacts on education, government, and interestingly enough, copyright law. Now, he wrote the book that taught generations of Americans how to spell and pronounce words. He made multiple changes to the educational system overall, and I'll give you an example in just a second. He was a founder of Amherst College, editor of the first daily newspaper in New York City. His writings, read and absorbed by our founding fathers, the ones we mentioned before, before they wrote the Constitution, and he was a founder of Connecticut's Anti-Slavery Society. When Noah Webster came from good stock, he was descended from the first governor of Connecticut and the second governor of the Plymouth Plantation. But he did not come from a wealthy family, in fact, far from it. It was all his father could do to finance Noah's studies at Yale and law school afterwards. Well, that was just out of the question. Noah saw things that needed to be improved, and when he did, he set out to improve them, and he did that quite a bit. Now, you're going to hear more examples about his educational improvements, but I just want to point out one right now. He insisted that students be broken into different age groups, correctly realizing years before it was the norm that they learned at different speeds and paces. Of course, we take it for granted today. We have different grades for different age children, but back in the 1700s, all the students were crammed together in the same one-room schoolhouse. And yet, after all this, we stopped talking about Noah Webster for the most part, at the word dictionary. Well, here today to tell us about this incredible Connecticut man is none other than the executive director of the Noah Webster House in West Hartford, Jeffrey Mainville. That house in West Hartford, well, that's where Webster was born back in 1758. When you think of Noah Webster, he's almost like P.T. Barnum. Everybody thinks of P.T. Barnum and they think of the circus, and and Barnum didn't do the circus until he was 60 years old. Then people think of Noah Webster and they think of the dictionary. That was later in life, and he did so many other things that people don't know about. But let's start off because you run what I think is one of the more exciting places. This is where Noah Webster spent some of his childhood. Can you kind of give an overview of what it was like for Noah Webster growing up there in West Hartford? We're the boyhood home of Noah Webster. As a young man here, a young boy growing up on this farm, its family didn't have a lot of money. You know, this was the West Division 
of Hartford, sort of the outskirts of the town. Good genes. His father and mother were both descended from governors. His mother was Mercy Steele. She was the great-great-granddaughter of William Bradford. Bradford you know, came over on the Mayflower in 1620. He's one of the founders of Plymouth Colony. He served as that colony's second governor. The father, Noel Webster Sr., he was a descendant of John P. Webster, who was you know, born in England and traveled to Massachusetts Bay and uh, in the 1630s and departed the colony, part of Thomas Hooker's party that set, you know, set out southward and, and became original settlers of Hartford. So growing up here on the farm, his father actually had to mortgage the farm to finance Noah Jr.'s Yale education. You know, this was a heavy lift for the family. And, and in 1774, the father, again, Noah Sr., uh, had believed in his son's potential. The economy was, was collapsing in the colonies at this time. And the price to send Noah Webster to college left his father uh, deeply in debt. So I think one of the things that's sad, I mean, you got to figure that Noah Webster could understand just how bright and dedicated and energetic his son was. And while he mortgaged his farm to send him to Yale College, he didn't have the wherewithal or the finances to continue his education in law, which is what Noah Jr. wanted, right? At Yale College, a lot of Noah Webster's friends were from wealthy families and not so here. There, a lot of them were serving and studying under Tapping Reeve in Litchfield, and Webster's family was unable to afford that. So Webster did become a schoolmaster at a schoolhouse in Hartford, and he ended up boarding with Oliver Ellsworth, who was a prominent lawyer already, and would later become one of Connecticut's first U.S. senators and even chief justice of the United States Supreme Court. They became lifelong friends, and Ellsworth opened up his law library to the young Webster, and that's how Noah Webster was able to study law, as he really you know, originally intended, while still you know, being able to do his teaching during the day. Now, one of the things you said to me before we started recording, which I think is really critical about Noah Webster, is this is a guy who, when he saw something that needed to be done, he did it. Let's talk about this for a second, because... What he saw as a teacher was that the educational system, in his mind, was in, in horrible shape. So he, what did he do about this? He, he went on and, and created something that was monumental at the time. Webster took a teaching job in 1780 in, in West Harvard, the same school he attended as a boy. You know, it's winter, it's cold. He said it was the coldest in more than a century, and he's, he's walking two miles each way. The schoolhouses, they're not well constructed. They leak. The roofs leak. They're cold. The kids are huddled around a stove. And there was often 70 to 80 students in a classroom of all different ages, which is an impossible learning environment. So Webster had said children will be educated cheaper if there are never more than 20 or 25 pupils under the charge of one instructor. This is basically the standard today, right? He sort of dictated that, you know, this makes sense that, you know, 20 to 25 is, is about enough for the size of a classroom. He did reject the Bible as a school textbook, which it was, you know, heavily the norm at the time. He sort of maintained that its overuse would diminish its value as a spiritual guide. He didn't want to use British textbooks. He felt very strongly that it was sort of bordering on sedition almost. He, uh, he complained that, first of all, you couldn't get them during the war, and they were unsuited for teaching American American kids. He also advocated for proper training for teachers. A lot of teachers were just hired without a lot of background. Webster said that children will never enjoy to learn under the lash of the master's rod, you know, trying to sort of beat kids into <laughs> into paying attention and and, and behaving in the classroom. So he thought that it was important to change all this. He saw a need here, and he saw something that needed fixing, and therefore he set out to do it. And so he started to create the Blueback Speller. Well, what we know is the Blueback Speller, but it was actually a sort of a three-pronged attack and upgrades and reform for education. I mean, it had a speller, it had a grammar, it had a reader. He originally planned to call it the American Instructor, which is a great name, but uh, <laughs> he ended up uh, seeking the endorsement of the president of Yale College, and as sort of a the pressure of from that gentleman's uh, input, he ended up calling the first edition a grammatical institute of the English language, comprising of easy, concise, and systematic method of education. It's a long, clunky name, and he ended up shortening it later, but there's so much in there to unpack. He was testing out 
his reform ideas in, you know, in real time in the classroom while he was writing this book. So, Jeff, I think it's reasonable to assume that we would turn to our elders in society to come up with some of these grandiose changes to education somebody experienced and whatnot. Noah Webster was 25 years old when he came out with the Blueback Speller, and he was actually younger than that when he started introducing some of his educational changes, which is just amazing. Now, the the Blueback Speller allowed him to make enough money to finance what he would do 23 years later when he published his first dictionary at age 48. But in between that time, those 23 years, it's not like he just sat in a room somewhere writing definitions to words. He was very active. And uh, could you just tell some of the things he was doing? He's known for his dictionary, I suppose, as an older man, but and, and not everybody peaks as a young man. Some say that Webster had you know, almost two lifetimes. You know, There was just so many things that he covered. One of the things that was so important that we don't even think about was that he's considered the father of American copyright law. When he was publishing this speller in 1783, very shortly thereafter, you know, he's selling lots of copies, but cheap imitations are coming out. And so obviously he's trying to address that. During the Revolutionary War period and just following it, when the Articles of Confederation are in place, the federal government really didn't have the power to create or enforce any sort of national copyright law. So he's traveling around to all the states trying to secure copyright laws from each state. He ends up soliciting a whole slew of prominent figures to help him with letters of reference. He's at Philadelphia. He's in Maryland. He's up in Massachusetts. His classmate at Yale, Timothy Dwight, was a minister up in Northampton, Mass., and helped push Webster's copyright legislation through the Massachusetts legislature. He petitioned James Madison at the federal level years later. So he's really the father of American copyright law. Under the aegis of Alexander Hamilton, he founded American Minerva, which was the first daily newspaper in New York City. It was a Federalist mouthpiece, essentially. You know, he was there for three years. He found it exciting to become like the voice of the federal government and influence national policy, but he sort of overestimated how popular it might be. The newspaper only lasted a few years. He published essays on the observations on the revolution in America, in which he argued that King George had forfeited all right to the allegiance of the American people. Most importantly, in 1785, he published Sketches of American Policy. These were essays that essentially outlined his vision for the new form of American government. This is before the United States Constitution. Harlow Unger, who's a historian who, you know, the final word on the life of Noah Webster, he argues that virtually every educated man in America who was part of this development of the Constitution had read Noah Webster's sketches of American policy. So he was incredibly busy behind the scenes, I guess. Some call him the forgotten founding father. He was right in there in the mix and uh, trying to shape policy in this emerging country. Now, in 1806, he's now finally in his 40s. I think it's ironic to think about this for a second. The British gentleman who published the first real dictionary, Samuel Johnson, published that three years before Noah Webster was born. And what Noah Webster turns around and does at age 48 with his compendious dictionary of the English language is to publish 37,000 words of which 5,000 had never appeared before in a British version. And he took it upon himself to change the spelling of some words like color and center and, and that sort of thing. But I mean, this was audacious to do something like this, wasn't it? I think that was a selling point. He was using this idea of a unique American cultural identity, possibly to sell books. But, but you know, I think he, he truly believed that, too. And, and the, the dictionary project came about originally because there was a need for vocabulary. It was just not possible to stuff all that into that little spelling book. The pronunciations and the meanings for words and teachers still had to use dictionaries from England. So... He sees an opportunity there. He decides to produce a small dictionary. There's other competing dictionaries, mostly British, but at least two other American ones. This 1806 attempt was 37,000 words, 5,000 words you couldn't even find in a British dictionary. He changed the spellings 
of a lot of words to make them more, quote, American. But, you know, I, I think that he got a lot of these ideas from Benjamin Franklin. They were very good friends for the last six years of Franklin's life. And, and Benjamin Franklin, also sort of a tinkerer and a guy that liked to solve problems, and probably one of the most famous Americans on the planet, was uh, also very interested in reforming language and improving it. You know, he made up his own letters that he wanted to <laughs> add to the alphabet. So Webster had incorporated a lot of Franklin's ideas into the speller. And then again, onto this dictionary, you know, Webster's adding words that were of Native American origin, you know, like hickory and skunk and succotash. Those weren't words that you would find in an English dictionary. These are the first time that some of these words were ever recorded in an English language dictionary. Just amazing. He then, 22 years later, as incredible as 37,000 words was, he almost doubles that then in 1828, when he's 70 years old, and publishes the first American Dictionary of the English Language. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, you know, uh, Joshua Kendall, he's another Webster scholar, he, he says that he suggested this was a retirement project, but his idea of perfection, he kept at it. I mean, this is double the size of the other one. 70,000 words. It took Webster 26 years to complete, virtually by himself. Wrote it, you know, with a quill pen and an inkwell. He set about to try to familiarize himself with about 28 different languages. The etymologies of all these words was important to him. It didn't sell well because it was very expensive. It was $20, which was an awful lot of money back then. Um, you know, probably only sold about 2,500 copies, and you know, a lot of them maybe to his friends and well-placed places like colleges and things. But. I guess what he's mostly known for was the dictionary because because of George and, and Charles Merriam. You know, they bought up the unsold copies of the second edition, and every edition since then, for 175 years, they made the decision to put his name right there on the cover, right next to theirs. It's hard to say with a life as incredible as his. It's what he's certainly most known for, and it, it really is an incredible achievement. Now, if I have my facts straight, I think it was 1966 when his childhood home, where you, where you are the director, opened as a museum. When you go in there and you drive in to work, what is it that sort of captivates your mind? What is it that kind of excites you about being there? When you look around, it's a nice neighborhood, you know, South Main Street and all these beautiful houses around it. But you have to try to block that out and remember that this was really the outskirts of Hartford at this time. And they own several parcels of land. And uh, when we have our school kids come here, we try to we, we talk a lot about what life was like on the Webster farm. It's hard when you look next door and you see all these houses, but we try to transport them back here. And, and I'm transported back every morning when I get here because it's time to immerse myself again in, in Noah Webster. And we do things here, opportunities for hands-on education that you can't do in a lot of places. There are other organizations in the area that, that do this sort of thing, but we we wanted to make sure that we showcase that sort of thing. And so we think a lot about, you know, what it is that we offer folks that is unique, you know, spinning wool into yarn and putting the yarn on the, on the loom. We have an 18th century barn loom here. That's you know, it's exceptionally large and it's upstairs in the bedroom and we have uh, got it all rigged up and we show the kids uh, and, and adults too, how the family weave. We do hearth cooking on the open fire. So, it's really exciting for me to walk in every day because I love history. I, I'm passionate about historic houses and preservation. I like to put myself in the eyes of the, the visitor. So, you know, when they walk in, they're just surprised. And I find myself surprised every morning. wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On, Connecticut's Beaten Path. Now, just in case you're wondering, the latest edition of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary now has, you ready, 470,000 words. And what's the very last word? Great trivia question. Zijagadin. It's a rare leafhopper found in South America. I want to thank our guest for today's program, Jeffrey Mainville, Executive Director of the Noah Webster House in West Hartford. You ought to pay him a visit there. The answer to this week's trivia question, 
The question was, the oldest chapter of this organization in Connecticut is turning 100 years old this year. And although they're not in the medical field, they've been shown to help our mental health. Well, the answer is the Newtown Forest Association and all the other many land trusts like it in Connecticut. Together, they can serve our land, which does lead to mental health and low-stress benefits for all of us. That's been proven through maintaining beautiful open space. Amazing Tales from Off and On, Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe and please stay healthy. Thank you.